Hey, I'm Al from Riptide Movement, and this is JP. Hey, how are you? And you're watching IndieBuddy.com. Um, I guess, I guess uh, just because the kind of the way the musical landscape has changed a lot, um, so we've been together 13 years as a band, and we've four albums released at this stage, and this is our fifth record, but kind of sixth, because we released a, a, an A and a B side, um, uh, Final last year because we made a web series last year called Plastic Oceans and we made it was like a, we wanted to kind of link them two songs to the web series so it was a whole kind of thing and then this time around um, we just found that basically with, with streaming it's uh, it's kind of transformed the music scene at the moment and that's uh, making an album it's kind of like a two year um, journey really like between from writing recording demoing it and and then producing it and then. Uh, promoting and releasing and touring it so it's kind of like two years and it's a serious investment isn't it? yeah yeah a lot of time and a lot of energy goes into it and um we, yeah we, we've we found kind of people don't really listen to albums as much as they used to anymore so it's, it's very playlist um kind of orientated the way people listen to music these days and it's very mood based as well like it, like it's kind of the play the playlist has transformed the music industry i think so it, we feel that um, if you're going to make an album, which we are a very album band, and you're going to like put that much time and effort and energy into it, and then you pick like you might write twenty songs, and then you actually only release twelve as an album, and you have a common thread going through. It's like a book from chapter one to twelve, and if people are only going to listen to three or four songs, um, you don't really get the whole picture. So we thought, it, why not like make uh, two EPs or like an EP every year. As opposed to an album every two years and just like put five tracks on it digitally but then we kind of stayed true to our album roots and we put two bonus songs on the vinyl so we released the ep as a vinyl with two bonus tracks seven tracks which is really a mini album long-winded answer but that's yeah and just some makes sense with my brain sometimes as well i think the mood lists are like i don't know i'm not i'm not huge spotify compared to the rest of the band but i just think the mood list is like Sometimes you can be in a really safe place listening to music, whereas maybe sometimes music should be challenging. And you know, like you, John Peel or some really good DJ would throw. Or for us, it was Phantom FM and TXFM. Mm. They you put it on the radio in the car, and basically did this new band from Australia that you would never really heard of would come on, and you'd be interested in this new music. And because the DJs had really good taste in music, you'd get this new kind of band. And I'm not saying that Spotify doesn't do that because it opens up loads of different arenas for various different things. But if people go on moods, they're kind of going, it's like, I don't know, I kind of feel it's like going in and it's kind of all selected for you. But I know the DJs do that as well, but for me it's just a bit, I don't know. But it can be cool though if you're... It works both ways, I think, yeah. Do you know, you can go on a playlist at a party, or if you're at the gym, or if you're, I don't know, if you're on a road trip, and it's kind of cool, you can just go on a hundred, hundred tracks, yeah. and most of them are going to be good on the playlist, and they're all from different, different artists. I like. suppose it just comes up to the, the whoever the person is selecting the list, isn't it? That's the... Yeah, but interestingly, we found that a lot of people actually don't have vinyl players. <laughs> yeah. So, so we were at a gig in Belfast the other night on Friday nights, and uh, it, like I suppose we took it for granted that everybody has a vinyl player, but but they don't. And a lot of people were requesting CDs. And we were like, they still do they? Yeah, what? Yeah, see, what are these CDs? But um, yeah, no, interesting. Yeah, we're, we're actually going to order some vinyl, or not vinyl, but some copies now on. CD because we I don't know we just thought everyone had a vinyl. I thought every house had a vinyl player from their like their mothers or their fathers and it was just kind of lying there all dusty and they could buy a vinyl and just come home and play it and they're like no we've never had a vinyl player so it's a bit odd for us. I have a cassette player in my car. Yeah. <laughs> Good, cassettes are cool. Yeah. I don't know if it'll go back to cassettes but uh... I think it's just a, it's a kind of a, a common thread common thread in our songwriting and I think I think I'll, um yeah, I, I, we like to have big choruses because maybe it's because we're a very live band, live bass band, and, and our shows are very energ energetic. And it's it's kind of, I guess, part of our makeup that kind of feels that we need these big chorus songs for, particularly when we're playing live. And I, I think our music's very uplifting anyway. The, you know, the, the, the music is very uplifting and the lyrics are very... Um, soulful and and uh, uplifting as well and I, I think a big chorus goes hand in hand with with the music and the lyric but that'd be my perspective on it
<laughs> I love how his neck turns. He's like, "What are you gonna say?" I'm like, um. <laughs> uh, "Yeah, no, I think it's the Nirvana and the Pixies have that kind of verse, loud chorus, and we're not like maybe that like punctuated, but definitely just we're massive fans of all of them bands, and I think that's part of the, you know, like you're kind of bringing someone in for the verse, and and then the chorus is like the answer, you know, like a question and the answer, and I think the bigger the chorus, like we we love playing live, and it's the energy, so." If you like that, well, then your music's going to be really big and really loud. But it's also nice just to kind of have them not all loud at the same time. You know what I mean? So it's like a bringing them in and then. Or pushing them away. I was kind of like giving them away over the head. There. Um, it's kind of. It's something that <coughs> sometimes we use in, in a few of our songs. It's in Elfin in the Room as well. Um, it's, it's a similar kind of thing. And it's. Uh, I guess it's kind of gone back to. Um, the kind of 60s beat pop bands kind of it's kind of bringing that in in a kind of in our own way uh, and we kind of have a unison vocal that we always use again going back to live so we just um but it was actually it had, it had a different part for that and it, it was very like the who um who are you who are you ooh, 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 ooh. and then it, it was too it was too close to that so i i, cause I did the lyrics so i wanted to kind of change that and uh and melodies is kind of my thing as well i love melodies so um, I think it's just it's a nice counter to the to the first lyric. And again, when you go back playing live, it's that answer call with the audience. So it is kind of a part of our song. Well, that's kind of how I write. So I always write from a metal. Um, lately, the last, um, I suppose that the, the last while I'm kind of writing the lyrics first and then and then making the song around it. But I've always wrote from a melody. So if if I'm at the piano or the, or playing the guitar. It's always you know, I start from that melody and then I try and and it has to be catchy because I think it's like a song is like it, it, the melody is like the vessel that you deliver the song in and if you have the best lyrics in the world and the melody isn't a strong melody you, you can't deliver that message or what you're trying to say because people are gonna switch to the next song or so you need I, I I just find if you need a really strong melody and it's something that maybe people relate to before they actually tap into the lyrics so i've always written that way from a melody and then when i bring the ideas down to the lads of that um it it kind of starts from there and then we kind of build around us but the melody is always core core to the song um yeah so, uh, as, again i think it comes down to um we definitely want to go back to guitars like the jail of a i'm sure a different answer to, to myself with jail is big on guitars as well but I think it, it, it comes back to um, what you're listening to at the time and what you're influenced by and where you want to kind of, where you feel the music should go. And for me, um, on the lead up to recording this EP, we would have spent a lot of time demoing the songs and kind of figuring out what way they wanted to sound anyway, because uh, we kind of got back into the production with, the, with these songs. And uh, I was listening to a lot of The Clash and The Cure and stuff. So I definitely wanted, um, like kind of UK punk, New York kind of punk beats in in definitely in, in, in the new stuff. Wanted to be rush, wanted the guitars to be really kind of in your face and real kind of not polished but kind of um you know big and kind of in your face, you know. And uh yeah, it just feels good to kind of go back to like a kind of a guitar based uh guitar based songs because the last album Ghost was very key based and synth and stuff so it's very it's cool and kind of um there's a lot of freedom and kind of going back into that and um, I'm sure Jay's Jay's different answer to yeah, no, that's, that's where similar, yeah no but just we, it definitely felt we we um even on the last album well in Ghost album Mal didn't play guitar and recording mm. and it was very it's a great album in lots of different ways <coughs> but it's I felt this was more a return to maybe what we're we're good at live and then we we hooked up with Tommy and Ashiga Tommy Glocken up in the Ashiga studios and he's very much a guy when he records, he wants the energy of the thing, not the preciseness of it. That's just kind of his vibe. And so I, like, as well as what Mal was saying, adding to that, when we were performing, he was just trying to get the essence of the music. And I, I was kind of interested in what music he was into, because, you know, and he put on these bands like the Minutemen and then um, Husker Du and just these fuzzy, dirty sounding. And I was delighted because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not particularly fond of studios at the best times because it's, I guess I wouldn't be super confident in the studio myself personally. So when I was allowed to just kind of plug in and, and just play, 
Tommy was like, this is great. And then I use your own guitar. And he's like, no, just it's the minimum amount of pedals, like 15 pedals. And he's like, no, I can really all the name, just plug in here. And it was just a kind of joy to play. And that's kind of how we started the band, you know, and we went back to London mm. 14, 13, 14. 14 years ago, yeah. We went over and literally, I don't know what we were like musically, because uh, but but literally we just went on stage and we went for it. There was no like it didn't matter who was in front of us, it didn't matter where we played, it didn't matter, you know. If you hit a bum note, it didn't matter. It was just we got through it because there was so much energy there. And we've kind of always had that, but now it feels like it's consistently there the last kind of year, or maybe since Christmas. And that's really exciting. On top of what Ronaldo was saying, it's kind of all fed into the same kind of trough and, you know, help with the music that we've, it's coming out from. Yeah, I felt like we we, we, we we decided to become more co-producers. I think this, this way, whereas before, maybe we would have been like with the producer, but kind of, maybe not co-produced. Whereas we kind of started producing ourselves at the start. The, start, yeah. the first album and second album, and then we got a producer in, and then this was more like just us kind of, I suppose, getting back into studio and getting reacquainted and doing that on ourselves. Because you, it's very easy to just kind of get a really deadly producer and then kind of sit back and go with him do because he's so good, like he's so great at doing it. But sometimes that's great, but other times then, you know, at a different point, you just kind of want to get, you want to get your hands on it as well, like, and kind of go, Let's try different things. And I think that's what happened this time around as well, as well as what Mal was saying. There's lots of other strands, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I guess that's kind of the reason. Um, that's the reason we got Tommy to co-produce the album with us because he was very open to that. Um, and I, th I think in a way, we it, it's important to work with producers as well and go through that whole journey. Um, and and <coughs> it's cool to work with different producers as well because you learn so much. So as Jay said, like we, when we done our first initial demos, we we would have kind of been messing around in the studio, uh, with different sounds and what we wanted, and then we were very lucky because we met um, a great producer called Tony Colton for our first album, and he produced it, and he had a very, um, sixties kind of, every producer's got a different style, and his his style was very like, you know, just plug in and play, capture that energy, and um. He was very, yeah, it was, was very like he was all about just ca capturing the, the energy and, and trying to, and, 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 and yeah, just trying to capture that in, in a recording. So that was an interesting, cool way of doing it. And then we worked with Ted as well, Ted Hust, which, which um, he's, a, he's a really great producer and he had a different method as well. So he, he would have taught, taught us a lot, like in, yeah, in terms of fun. sonics and even, even songwriting and structures and stuff. So we learned a lot from Ted. And then we worked with Chris Cody as well. To, Fantastic producer. He did, he did different way as well, kind of maybe in between what Ted and Tony were doing. And then so we, I think after being in the studio for so long and working on so many albums and, and records then, it kind of gives you a bit of confidence that, you know, actually I think we can we can do something here ourselves that's pretty cool and, and have our own stamp on it. So I think we're kind of savouring that at the moment and um, with the next EP after this one, it'd be definitely... I think it'd be maybe fully produced by ourselves that one. Yeah, Do you know. I, yeah, I think it's important as well to have a bit of time because we a lot of time we were time constraints. Yeah, working with producers and stuff, it can be just like you're in and you kind of have stuff ready. Whereas I think the last one was a bit more, uh, you know, just let things settle kind of thing and try that and then maybe give it a day or two. You know, whereas we didn't have that luxury before, just because we were so busy and uh, we've always been busy gigging and touring and. Even writing music is a very big part of it, as in like we'd go away for two weeks or a week and uh, we'd rent a gaff down the country and we'd there for the whole week just writing songs and then we'd have to take another week to get to tighten all them up and then we'd have to show them to the producer and then we'd have to go through pre-production which would be which songs we're going to use and then we get the studio, so there's all these different kind of levels you have to and it just it takes a lot of time and effort and that so but, but like we didn't have a whole lot of time because we are so busy so the last kind of group of songs that we did, I felt we had a little bit more time. We were still tight, but just a little bit more breathing space or something. It felt like that anyway. Yeah, well, like I think the I'll Be There and Something Special and there's a one that's on the vinyl called Follow A Little More. They they would have been worked, um, demos done up on Garage Band and they'd be yeah. very, very close to, uh, in terms of actual like quality, sound wise, It'd be nothing as like the EP because the recordings wouldn't be great because we done rough on rough microphones and stuff. But the actual ideas and how it sounds as one thing, or how it, how it fits as a structure, 
and the different parts would be very similar to what the demos were. So it's, it's kind of cool to have that map of where you want it to be and then bring it into the studio and then and, and have it at around 90%. So you, you leave around 10% for new ideas and, and that's clean. Because I found in the past where you've gone in with too many ideas and you're too scattered. So you could have 30 or 40 ideas and it's, it's nearly like trying to catch leaves in the wind or something. It's just, it's it, it, it's very hard to kind of train your focus like on. Crystal maze, you know, puts all the golden tickets and you're trying to work Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 too, it's too overwhelming, you know. And I, I, I think I'm, from, from going through that journey, I, I think I'd be fair having the process, <coughs> having the time to actually work it, work through a song and demo it and then kind of listen to it for a while. And after a month or two months ago, actually, that's shit, or you know, I don't like that anymore, and, and this is better. But I've found a different idea, a new song out of that. So, I, because sometimes I think if, you, if you're making an album in such a small period, say, look at like, like we've done in the past, we've like we've done Getting True, and then we have a lot of songs worked out, but we did it in a three week period, and Ghost, we did it in a four or five week period, and that's Ghost in particular. We, we nearly wrote that album while in recording, mm-hmm. you know, so and, and it's a great album. Um, but I guess there's, there's some songs that um, you wish you had a bit more time with. Um, I don't I don't think we let the pressure get to us. As Jay said, we were just super busy. Like so, we like, we released that album. It just kind of blew up for us, and then we were just touring everywhere and gigging everywhere. And in between the tours and the gigs, we might have a few days off. I think we got a couple of weeks here and there, and we spent that time uh, writing the fourth album, Ghost. So like we, Jay said, like we rent a house for a week load all the gear in and work through all the ideas. And I think in hindsight, um it we maybe should have took a bit more time on us and not put so much pressure on ourselves. Although we we got a great result with that with that album. But we never, I don't think, allowed the fact that getting through it was brilliant that skull cell and number one, that's phenomenal, like looking back now it's unbelievable and and really proud of it. But I don't think we ever let it get to us because we, for, for, I, th- I think as a band, uh, speaking from the band here, that we're kind of a band that we don't like stop and check ourselves and go, oh, well done, that was amazing. You know, it's always kind of, we're on to the next thing, we're on to the next thing, we're on to the next thing. So I don't think I ever felt the pressure from getting through. It, it just felt that, that with Ghost that we're going to make something bigger and better. And then even after Ghost with something special, it's always we're going to make something bigger and better. And, and, and stretch out as a, as a band and as songwriters and just get better and better. Yeah, just no, it's just, I suppose, for myself, it's the, you know, when we hit the right spot, sometime in a gig or whatever, this energy, it's always there, you know what I mean, if you're a musician. So it's kind of like, for me, I, I'm at Mal writes songs, so I can't, I'm sure he gets writer's block whenever he does, but for me, music's like, okay, you're not going to be great one day, but you just keep playing it because that's what you do, and then suddenly it just comes out. So I would have that kind of attitude of just, I know by playing with Mal that he's going to have an idea, and Jerry will and, and, and Gar, and that something's going to come out from it. And then, you know, I go off and listen to some new music, or I'll go traveling and I'll have an idea. And that's, I, it's not something to worry about more. So it's just, you got to give it, and like Mal said, the other thing that happened was, I don't think we've stopped. It feels like with this group of songs, it's the first time we've stopped and actually maybe looked mm. at what we've done over 13 years. And we sat down and we were like, we could write two books. No no joke. The amount of funny stories, the amount of weird shit that's happened to us. And we've never even like kind of digested it ourselves. We're just like always kind of looking forward, always looking to see what's ahead of us and never looking back. And it's only our friends and maybe loved ones and mates there. Oh man, like, you's, like you's, what you've done is amazing. And we're just like in Australia, we're in India, we're in Russia, we're in America, we're in, you know, Prague doing Paddy's Day. We're in, and it's, you don't even, sometimes when you're not busy, you don't, I imagine it's someone that works traveling on airplanes all the time, you know, like just that kind of person, and they're flying everywhere in like an insurance adjuster or something, and they just get this weird kind of, they're just busy, they're just, you know, they don't really take stock of what they do. And I'm not saying we're insurance adjusters, but it's kind of a little bit like that, they're just kind of that busy, you know. But then there's the moments to come on stage where it's all worth it, and it's just this, you know, this pumping kind of greatness that just, just joins together the dots, you know. Yeah, the, um... There, we were just chatting about this earlier actually with uh, or with Eamon um, from Something Happens he, he was saying today just after crafting kind of a new show they were playing um, 
a really intimate venue in Dundalk last night, it's like an old jail. Um, so it's kind of cool, I think, now because the, the idea of a venue is changing as well. You know, it's not just that, it's kind of, you know, like a room with a stage and a, and a sound desk and, it, you know, like your standard kind of room. Now it's like, like we, we were in London there a couple of weeks ago and we played a, a brewery, which was brilliant. It was class, like, it was such a cool, cool space. And there were 150 people there that we, that never, it was actually a great gig how it happened as well because we were in London, we were playing uh, Friday in the Islington. It's a great little venue over there. And we arrived into London on Thursday because we had promo on radio interviews and stuff. But we were, we had nothing on on Thursday night and we were saying it'd be cool to kind of like find somewhere, maybe an open mic session or something. And so we got in touch with um, So Far Sounds because was it, they had a gig on in, in London and just applied for tickets, you know, to go to the gig because it looked like it was a cool venue, it was in a brewery. And it said leave a comment. And um, so I just left a comment saying, Oh, by the way, like we love tickets for the gig, but by the way, we're a band from Dublin and we're playing the Islington tomorrow night and we're at a loose end tonight, we're not really up to much. <clears throat> so if you want us to get up and play a few songs, we'd love to. So uh, they, they got back straight away and said, yeah, of course. Like, so it, to play that, that, that venue was cool and that, that was, um, it was about 100, 120 people at it. And so we're like, we've played, like we've, we've played, like even in Hamburg last two weeks ago, we played to 90 people there in a really small little room. And, and then gigs are, can be magic. They, they can be daunting though as well. Like, I, I, I nearly find like, uh, like we've played massive gigs as well. Like we've played with Ron Stones and we've, we've played with Neil Young and we've played the main stage of Electric Picnic, uh, that, which was incredible. Like that'll always stand out my, in, 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 like when I look back through all the years of the band, that was definitely one of the highlights. It was a Saturday, it was, we had a perfect slot, it was four o'clock. In the in the day, the, the weather was perfect. The album had just blown up. Everyone knew the songs, and so there was forty thousand people coming out to see us, and it was just a sea of people. And for to play a gig like that's just so so easy because the crowd are with you already, do you know. And and I find it's more challenging if you're playing a smaller, more intimate venue. But then I think we're finding this. Um, there's a bit of magic in that now as well because you're kind of you're re. Um, you're kind of reworking the songs to suit the, the room and even even like we I think that was a great gig remember that church we played the same day yeah it's nice wasn't it yeah, the, yeah the, it's, it's incredible wasn't it it's, it's, like it's a, well I'm not saying naked but you're kind of really stripped back the songs mm. are really stripped back which is kind of great in one way because I think Mal used to write a lot of them on the acoustic so you know, if it works on the acoustic it'll work with a band but the great thing about that is if you do do the acoustic it's going to work mm. You know, if it's a rock song, you can bring it down to acoustic pretty easy because that's maybe who he wrote it. And the song is just like, it's very, it's like the other voices thing. It's just very intimate and the people couldn't drink alcohol. There was no booze allowed. So we all walked out with uh, bottles of beer from the, the back room and they're all sitting there like dying of the thirst, having their tea. And they're going, what the hell? There's no wine. It's a church. They should have wine at least. And we all walk out going, ah, oh, yeah. God, there's way too much beer back there. And they're all just looking at us going, but, um, yeah, no, it's it's a great. It's I think it's um I think it kind of adds to your um your kind of put strings on as a performer. It adds to your strings because you can do it to be kind of rock show now, but can you do the acoustic one as well? So it's like a different a different kind of thing, but just just as important and just as good, you know. I I think I I think the rock school might have just started out body fairness when when we were starting as a band thirteen years ago. But it, yeah, I I'd love. If I was to do it all again, I'd, I'd love that experience of, because particularly in BIM and stuff, they, they teach you about the industry and how it works. And for us, it was, we had, we had not a clue about no, the industry. When we got yeah. into it, it was just like, we were so naive, which is great as well, because you're going to have to learn yourself. But I guess you could... Um, save a lot of time. Save a lot of time. just goes, don't do that, do this. You know what I mean? Because I think as well as <clears throat> saying to the lads before, with the kind of advent the way things are gone, but this is in my perspective, there's not many, I don't know, maybe it was back in the day, older musicians would take under the wing and show you how things were done. You know, you might have been, you might meet at a cafe, a record store, or someplace that would happen. And I kind of feel like that's, back about, you know, when we were kind of there, it wasn't there as much, you know? So we were kind of, in a sense, lone wolves. You know, we didn't, you know, have maybe people showing us things, even musically, like. Mm. And... I feel like with the colleges, that's 
great you know that they have that instruction because they can do what we do and kind of just go out and be themselves and learn stuff but they also have that instruction and i think back in the 60s and 70s 80s and 90s people used to do that for fun they used to hang around and play with each other and jam and learn mm-hmm. stuff and I don't, that's maybe it's a personal thing for me but i didn't feel that happens that much around our band or at the time that we came out i felt it was just you know you'd learn off a tab book or you'd learn you know a little bit you know, maybe before the advent of all the YouTube videos and all that, there was, you know, there just wasn't, and it was probably laziness on my part, but I just feel like that the fact that they have that course, and it was great because they can do both. They can do that side and then they can just do the unpolished and rough part if they want, but now they have the back and, you know. It's important as well to know, to, to have an idea of the industry because it's, uh, there's, so much, there's so many uh, facets and avenues in the industry that it'd be nice to have a kind of a, even just a, general knowledge you know, not an expert in each area but just to just knowledge of how the business works because it, it makes life a lot easier for you um starting out i think <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we always we always get asked that question we always go be a stockbroker uh, um advice god well well miles often said it but i i feel that you should always stick to what you believe in you know it can be it's great to have that instruction for them but i think you need to have a good solid belief in what you know confidence in your own ability which comes from just experience and you know practice and all that kind of thing but just to kind of stick to your guns be a bit flexible but stick to your guns and i, I would say personally don't rely on it 100 percent. like have some other money avenue coming in just for the balance because i feel mm. i feel music is, is, is an amazing thing once you get to travel and you get to you know do other things to feed back into the music which if you're just doing music it can be great as well like, but it can be it can be like tough if it doesn't work out if you know what I mean and I wouldn't like to see people in that situation yeah I don't think that's good that's, that's the advice I think uh, yeah I, I, I kind of would echo what Jay says definitely um, yeah to to play your own music and to kind of not go along with fads or what is in at the moment and just kind of play what you, as Jay says why you believe in it or what, where you are kind of you're you're kind of drawn towards do you know so like like i find a lot of bands um they might have you know they write a song and all their songs sound very similar or the same no matter what album like it might be a little a bit of an evolution i i, I find with our band we're we're, we're different because like, if you go if you go through all our albums um it's always guided by what we're kind of into and listening to at the time and all our albums are so are so different and even a lot of songs on each album are so different. So I, I would think we're a band of songwriters more so than just a band that sounds a certain way. And all you have to do is go back to listen listen to our back catalog to, to hear that. Like Tip Jars is very blues, very Americana. Uh, Keeping On is, is country, it's folk. It's Americana as well. Uh, Getting Through, is, it's got all them elements, but it's kind of more indie and it's kind of more, I guess we kind of found our sound then. And then, like we could have made another get through but we didn't want to we we kind of stressed out a bit more with ghosts and we you know we we, we wanted to kind of experiment with keys and synths and now we've kind of gone full circle again i think yeah i, I think so and I, I think you'll see that tonight at the gig that it's not one certain kind of um uh, i don't know you, you can go to like to say <laughs> play the gig in belfast the other night and in the other room there was a kiss tribute band on and um a lot of people in the audience look like the band, I guess. And I, when you go and see our gig tonight, I think if a lot of different age groups and different different people, a lot of different people. So I think, I think that's uh, we don't really have a demographic. Yeah, and I kind of kind of like that because if you see Bruce Springsteen as well, if you see people in his gigs, it's all types. And I'm like, I'm a big fan of society catering for all types of people. You know, not just one type. So. I think our band does that not not intentionally but just mm. i think it's because maybe our sound evolved from the blues thing and a lot of people are in the 60s 70s you know they'd be older then but um yeah and um, we're gonna have a chicken curry <laughs> uh what's next i suppose just do do the cycle again of just writing music and you know seeing where we're at like we said with the where we're at song wise as in like what music we're listening to and you know, it's just, we just have to still get this one on the road and see how far we can kind of push it. We're really excited to get the EP out. There's a new song. Um, is this what we're all looking for? Is the next one? 
Yeah, that's out on Friday, actually. Yeah. Friday, and it's really just like as punky as like anything, and it's so much fun. We didn't play it in Belfast, we gave it its first outing, and it's just great. So, this EP is kind of like it has a, a bit to run, and then we're just going to see where things go. But like, it'll be back into the cycle of what where we're at, and then trying to transmit that into musical form. And then to tour it, you know, to tour it again. That's the. Thanks for the, thanks for the interview. Yeah.